Hi, my name is Chris Parkhurst. I'm a documentary filmmaker, and I'm also the host of the Documentary Life podcast, a show that spans 140 episodes, has been downloaded in over 135 countries, and uh, I've been producing for about five years. I decided to put each and every episode up here onto YouTube to sort of expand the audience, and as we say in the show, maybe inspire and inform some more doc filmmakers, hopefully like yourself. Um, in the episodes, you may find some older, maybe outdated URLs, in particular, any of the documentary filmmaking courses that we do offer online. If you have any questions about the URLs, simply look in the show notes on this page here on this YouTube page, and that'll be able to take you where you need to go to. Other than that, I hope you enjoy the show, and uh, it's great to have another listener to The Documentary Life. Have a great day. Microphone check, one, two, CC. Hello and welcome, CC. Hello and welcome, one, two, three, four, five, six. She sells seashells by the seashore. She sells seashells by the seashore. <laughs> there we go, rolling. You know, I think it's a very exciting time to be entering this field. When I started working in documentary in the late 90s, it was kind of on the margins. It was kind of the broccoli of entertainment. I think it's moved into a much more central space uh, or this part of the spectrum in terms of people's entertainment choices. So I think it's a very exciting time. At the same time, this is not a field where people come in to get rich. So I do think people have to be clear eyed, you know, because some of these films can take years to make. Independent filmmaking can be a lonely furrow to, to plow. And while it's a fantastic community, when you're out in the field by yourself facing challenges, it can be somewhat daunting. So we wanted to alleviate some of that pressure. Hello and welcome to The Documentary Life, a show that sets out to inspire and inform you on how to best live and lead your own documentary life. I am your host, Chris G. Parkhurst, and this is episode number 58. And it is brought to you by Barong Films, proud creators of Documentary Film, the Documentary Life Podcast, and the Documentary Academy, our industry-changing A to Z documentary filmmaking program that will transform you into the documentary filmmaker that you've always wanted to be. Find out more at thedocumentarylife.com slash academy. On this show, I've often talked about how my journey with documentary how it first began in the fall of 2004 on a film that I worked on in Cambodia. Up until that time, I'd spent the last couple of years working in the hotel industry, occasionally taking on a few shooting gigs, doing wedding videos, that sort of thing. But I was mostly working full-time in the service industry and shooting videos on the side. In fact, it wasn't long before I left for Cambodia that I'd finally finished editing on a digital narrative feature that I'd, I'd written, I'd, I'd directed it, I'd, I'd edited, even played a small role in it. You know the drill, total DIY indie filmmaking. And, and, and I was daily dreaming of directing movies for a living someday. Not in Hollywood, of course, because I didn't like Hollywood movies. I, I was going to direct independent films like, like Denmark's Lars von Trier was doing, like Canada's Adam McGoin was doing, or some of that really early stuff that, that Gus Van Sant was getting into. At the time, I was immersing myself in the subject of film and filmmaking. I was watching movies all of the time. Every Friday before work, I'd, I'd go to the cinema and, and watch the, uh, a new release. Nearly every night, I was devouring DVDs. I was, I was also keeping a journal of all the films that I was watching and, and, and jotting down notes about the, the writing, the editing, the shooting, directing. I, I'd take weekly trips down to the bookstore, um, which was Powell's in Portland, Oregon, for anyone familiar with the, with the Pacific Northwest of the U.S. And, and I'd scour the shelves looking for the latest how-to books on, in, on indie filmmaking, um, you know, directing talent, directing for the camera, uh, how to shoot cinema, how to edit movies, how to write screenplays, you name it. I probably have owned it and, and, and read it as well. And movie magazines. Oh, the movie magazine collection. I had, I had boxes of these things. You name it. Movie Maker, Filmmaker, um, Entertainment Weekly, Film Threat, back when they had a print publication, uh, Film Quarterly. I spent so much money on these things. It was, it was kind of ridiculous. And in hindsight, the money that I was spending on these magazines, well, probably could have you know, paid for mini DV tapes or, or a hard drive or, or something. 
I was attending indie film seminars. I, mean, I was going to film screenings at independently owned film houses. I was at, attending uh, movie maker film club uh, club meetups. I was meeting people at these places all the time, and and we'd have conversations. We would share ideas. We'd share film equipment. We would work on one another's projects. It was great fun. We were all barely getting by, but we were all, you know, we were all living the dream of dreaming of becoming the next Quentin Tarantino or or Robert Rodriguez. And this whole time, documentary film was the farthest thing from my mind. I rarely watched documentary, not because I didn't like it or anything, but I was just never really properly introduced to it, I, I guess. And it wasn't a thing in terms of of popularity and availability in the way that it certainly is now. Um, I was writing a lot at the time, and and that may may have had something to do with it as well. I I very much enjoyed writing screenplays that would never be made, of course. Um, (laughs) Fast forward to 2004, when I'm first asked to accompany a a fellow filmmaker to Cambodia to work on, on his doc. Um, I would be responsible for all of the sound, and and he would shoot everything. And this was probably, and and he would hire me to edit the film afterwards. Uh, this was probably the first that I really started taking a look at documentary, and this was most certainly the first time I would work on a documentary film shoot. So I quickly tried to ramp up the limited knowledge that I had on the subject before, you know, before we'd embark on our trip to Southeast Asia. I watched as many docs as I could. I, I tried to read what books um, there were that were out there. There weren't that many. Um, and, and magazines were super limited except for you know, the occasional random academic um, like biannual type of publication that, that I might come across. Uh, I, I figured I could at least find some resources online, but even those were limited to to, to really user groups, um, for example, at, at, say, colleges and universities. There just really wasn't that much readily available information on the subject of documentary filmmaking at that time. It seemed like I was really going to have to, to basically learn this doc filmmaking thing on the fly as I went. Even today, while there's there's certainly way more resources than there used to be, it still pales in comparison, you know, to the amount of courses, workshops, books, marketing that surrounds the whole indie narrative filmmaking thing. Even this podcast, for example. When I first started doing research about filmmaking podcasts, the field was absolutely inundated with shows about indie filmmaking or or indie film appreciation. There was no shortage of these types of podcasts. But podcasts tailored to the documentary filmmaker? I was actually pretty shocked at what I found, or really what I didn't find. Um, I thought it had to be a mistake, to be honest. There there were a handful of documentary film fan appreciation type shows. And by the way, one of my faves is called SUPDOC, S-U-P-D-O-C, SUPDOC, which is basically two San Francisco uh, comedians who will bring on a special guest and discuss a particular documentary. You should check it out. It, it, it's actually pretty smart and, and uh, hilarious stuff. Anyhow, th- there were some podcasts dedicated to the appreciation of doc film as a genre. And there seems to be more weekly, actually. But, but, but almost no shows that were dedicated to the craft of documentary filmmaking. And certainly none that explored what we have since come to term the documentary life, or, or that is to say, the lifestyle of a documentary filmmaker. And it's a huge reason why I decided to do this podcast. I wanted to do a show that that really not only talked about the various aspects of of documentary filmmaking like fundraising, writing grants, editing practices, how to get superior sound, you know, the best ways to get great looking B-roll, but I also wanted to be dialoguing about the lifestyle of the documentary filmmaker. Uh, What were sources of income that we could be tapping into? How were we functioning as artists and trying to raise families at the same time? What were insurance options for us self-employed? What was it like when uh, shooting films in developing countries? These sorts of things. There really weren't that many websites or books or podcasts or whatever that were dedicated to this sort of thing. 
I've talked in the show about the necessity of having a place to come to, a community of like-minded individuals who could share ideas and act as a support group. I've talked about the need for, for networking doc filmmakers with one another, how I've worked in the commercial film TV industry for years and, and really out of livelihood, how, how we're all a very connected, intimately connected community, this commercial industry. That's how we stay working, right? And, and that when I really started looking at the documentary community, I was finding an oftentimes pretty isolated, pretty undernourished group who was desperately in need of some resources, some conversation with other people who lived and breathed documentary. So the documentary life was, was most certainly born with all of these things in mind. And it, of course, continues to grow. We here at TDL, we continue to learn what the needs and desires of the doc filmmaking community are. And hopefully it's reflected in our programming, our show's topics, and the guests that we have come on the show. And speaking of guests, we are about to have a conversation with a person who knows all about the importance of helping the community of documentary filmmakers. His name is Simon Kilmery, and he is the Executive Director of International Documentary Association, or IDA as it's more commonly referred to as in the community. And the truth is, there are few people who can probably speak better to the needs and desires of our doc filmmaking community. And so I think I'd like to keep my segment here short this week and really get to that conversation. And so in approximately 30 seconds, give or take a few, we're going to come right back and we're going to have that conversation with Simon Kilmery. I am your host, Chris G. Parkhurst, and this is The Documentary Life. When I first started making documentary films, I was often making them entirely on my own dime. It wasn't that it was a conscious decision on my part, I just really wanted to get out and start making my film. Does this sound familiar to you? When you have a great idea for a doc and the opportunity to get out there and start shooting, you don't want to let something like money get in the way of that. And for a while, it may not, but unfortunately, unless you have unlimited resources, eventually it will. Not having money for your doc film will slow you down, reduce your crew size, your film production values and aesthetics, even the story you're able to tell. And that's not even accounting for the additional stress, frustration, and your inability to work on the project full time. We don't accept that for ourselves anymore, and we don't want you to accept it either. Money is out there for every documentary film, and that includes yours. Every day, money is donated or awarded to documentary films. Why not yours? The trick is in knowing where to look for it and how to secure it for your film. In the Documentary Academy, we have the most comprehensive funding module that you will find anywhere in any course on fundraising for your documentary film. We cover the A to Z on raising funds for your film so you will never again be left wondering where the money's coming from. Enroll in the Academy today by going to the documentarylife.com slash academy and start your journey to raising 10, 25, or even $100,000 for your documentary film. Now let's join my conversation with IDA Executive Director Simon Kilmery. My guest today is Simon Kilmery, the Executive Director of IDA, the International Documentary Association. Simon, it's an absolute honor and pleasure to have you on the program. We've wanted to have somebody from IDA on the program for a while now, so thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. And if you wouldn't mind, Simon, what I'd like to do is, is I'm, I'm actually going to read a little bit about, about your background here so, so my audience has some idea of the magnitude of the individual we're speaking with here today. Simon, Kilmery, uh, Simon Kilmery's background includes being executive producer of POV, the long-running PBS showcase of independent documentaries, serving as executive producer since 2006. He has received 13 Emmy Awards, more than 50 Emmy nominations, five George Foster Peabody Awards, four DuPont Columbia Awards, and is a two-time recipient of the Best Continuing Series Award from the International Documentary Association. He also serves as Chief Executive of American Doc Documentary, also known as AMDOC, POV's nonprofit parent organization. Prior to becoming executive producer and CEO, he was Amdoc's chief operating officer from 99 to 2006. 
Kilmarie has won numerous accolades in his role at POV, including a Primetime Emmy Award, 12 News and Documentary Emmy Awards, a Special Emmy Award for Excellence in Documentary Filmmaking, as well as more than 50 News and Documentary Emmy nominations. Again, he is the recipient of five Peabody Awards, three DuPont Columbia Awards, a Grierson Award, and is a two-time recipient of the Best Continuing Series Award from the IDA, as I just mentioned. He has served on juries and panels at film festivals around the world, including IDFA, Tribeca, Visions du Real, and Doc of Eve. And he has lectured and conducted workshops at universities, film schools, and conferences in the U.S., as well as internationally. And of course, since 2015, Simon has been the executive director of IDA. Wow, Simon, uh, that is a mouthful. <laughs> that is absolutely beyond impressive. Um, I, ha- I have to say, Simon, I took a quick peek at, at, at your IMDb of all places, and, and mm-hmm. one finds loads of incredibly impressive executive producer credits to your name. But I'd love if you would if, if you would do this with me. I'd love to go back and learn where documentary first started for you. What is your connection to documentary? I really came into this field serendipitously and through through a passion uh, from watching a lot of films. I was in in New York in the late 80s and early 90s, and I was watching films like Joe Berlinger and Bruce Sanofsky's Brothers Keeper. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I, w- I was catching up on the classics by, by Maisels and Pennebaker. Uh, and, and POV actually started on broadcast mm. in 1988. And I was just watching it as a public television watcher and blown away by the types of films that were being showcased on the series. Yeah. Uh, you know, I would watch a film like Silver Lake Life, and this was at the height of the AIDS crisis. And that's yeah. a film by Tom Joslin and Peter Friedman, which follows two lovers here in Los Angeles as they care for each other um, as they are dying of AIDS. And there was a lot of fear and misinformation around AIDS at that point. Mm. Um, and this really turned that narrative on its head. It and certainly really did, yeah. Two human beings loving and caring for each other in this, in this, in this crisis. Um, or I would see a film like Lisa Lehman's Metamorphosis, Man into Women, be an early film dealing with transgender issues mm. Uh, and just be exposed into these worlds which I would never ever have access to and I fell in love with documentary film as a way of exploring the world Um, so um, I got very fortunate and very lucky um, to land a job at POV in um, 1999 um, uh, mostly as a CEO uh, uh, on the administrative and fundraising side of the organization and gradually get more and more involved in content. And that was you know, one of the great things about POV in those days, it was a very small organization, and the opinion of everyone mattered. Um, uh, so I, I got to really go to film school there. Um, ah, I see, I, right. I never went to film school, but that was my that was my film school, was just watching and watching and watching and watching. And um, and I still love to do that. I watch a ton of films, and to me, it's uh, it's one of the most gratifying things about m- m- my career is being mm. able to, to to have that luxury to do that. It's interesting you mentioned something in there, Simon, about exploring other worlds as a um, as a real sort of draw to documentary. And I think that's the case with a lot of documentary filmmakers. I know it certainly is for myself, quite literally um, in 2004 is really when I began working on my uh, sort of first documentary work. And that was in the country of Cambodia, which has long since become sort of a home away from home for me doing both commercial and doc work there. But it was during that time in Cambodia, sort of exploring a culture and people that I had known nothing, really little to nothing about before going there, um, that I fell in love not only with that part of the world, with Southeast Asia, but really documentary filmmaking as a genre. So I knew then, you know, coming back to the States, that that documentary w- was certainly my calling. And, and there really is a draw there for people, this idea of exploring worlds, isn't it? Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I, have, I, I feel like I've been able to through through the lens of filmmakers but also not just the filmmakers but the people uh, whose stories are shared gain a much more um, nuanced understanding and by mm-hmm. no means complete but but uh, much more nuanced understanding of 
of parts of the world of issues than I would if I just you know watched the nightly news. So so um, to me it's like uh, you know I, I talk about this often you know where you know I read the New Yorker and I read these wonderful kind of creative essays by by the people who write for these for the New Yorker and are 10, 20, 30 pages long. Yeah. To me that's the equivalent in printed journalism what, of what great documentary can do. Totally. Uh, it's discursive. It's that it's, it, it it goes down these uh, these alleyways which you wouldn't expect to go down, and then it turns around and comes back. It's you know it's it's a wonderful form for kind of uh, exploring your curiosity. And Simon, how did IDA your involvement with IDA? How did that happen out of all of this? Well, I yeah, you know, I had been at POV for 16 years, which is a good long time. And I think a series like POV, one of its strengths, and this, this year is its 30th anniversary, which is pretty incredible. Yeah. And, and congratulations to the team that's, that's, that's running it now. So I'd been there 16 years, and it felt to me that it's it was time for a fresh vision to come in. You know, I felt we had done great work over the years and, and raised its profile and worked with some fantastic filmmakers. But for me, it was time to to try a new challenge um, and to, to give over. You know, I always felt I was, you know, while my title at POV was executive producer, I really felt like a caretaker. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm holding this kind of very um, precious space in, uh, on the broadcast spectrum and trust for filmmakers and trying to make sure it's in as good a shape as possible wow. for them. And then I was talking to the folks here at IDA, and IDA has been around for a long time, but was going through some transitions. And after you know much back and forth, I felt, okay, this is a place perhaps where I can make a difference. I can try and build what I've been a you know, a, a respected and and and, and um, venerable organization for a long time, and but but really take it nationally and internationally, and and look to see how it could be more effectively serving the filmmaking community. Simon, if I may, I'd like to read directly from the website uh, the IDA mission statement. Documentary storytelling expands our understanding of shared human experience, fostering an informed, compassionate, and connected world. The the International Documentary Association is dedicated to building and serving the needs of a thriving documentary culture. Through its programs, the IDA provides resources, creates community, and defends rights and freedoms for documentary artists, activists, and journalists. I think coming right out of that mission statement, I think I would love for you to help us understand, and maybe it's probably self-evident, but I would love to hear from, from, from your words, Simon, what do you feel are the biggest reasons a documentary filmmaker should be aware in using something like IDA? Well, I think we try and provide a whole range of support services for the field and for filmmakers on, a, on an individual level. If you look across the spectrum of the, the work and the programming we do, this year we launched a new documentary film fund called the Enterprise Journalism Fund. Right. And that's with the support of the MacArthur Foundation and the Jonathan Logan Family Foundation, where we are... Uh, giving out um, uh, both production and R&D grants to filmmakers working at that intersection of, of documentary and journalism or creative documentary and journalism. Right. Um, and, and one one reason, uh, you know, a couple of reasons why, why we started that was, you know, uh, coming out of my time at POV where I would see filmmakers increasingly struggle to get their films financed early (laughs) um, uh, and certainly have very little access to R&D money beyond, you know, the good work that is done by the independent television service and places like the Catapult Film Fund. And then also a publication or study that was put out uh, by Pat Arfterheide at the uh, Center for Media and Social Impact at American University. And I recommend people download that. It's at the Center for Media and Social Impacts website, and it's yes. a document called Dangerous Docs. And, and, and it really examines the challenges that ind- independent filmmakers face when taking on entrenched powers, yes. be, they, be they corporate or government, and the threats that, 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 that they face in, in dealing with that. So that was really the genesis of something like the Enterprise Fund, to provide early R&D support, early production support, and then also support along the way. So we put together a team of advisors from the Pulitzer Center of Crisis Reporting, Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press, 
Washington Post and a whole host of other legal and journalism resources that we could then make available to these filmmakers as they're in production. So it's trying to fill that early production gap, but then also provide, you know, this ongoing support. You know, as as you well know, independent filmmaking can be um, can be a lonely uh, furrow to to plow. And um, uh, while it's a fantastic community, when you're out in the field by yourself facing challenges, it can be somewhat daunting. So we wanted to alleviate some of that pressure with the enterprise. And, and we talk a bit about that, obviously. In some ways, it's at the heart of our of our show. You know, unlike, you know, where I've worked in commercial and features, where you have, you know, larger sized crews, uh, a larger support system, if you will, around you, documentary tends to be this, it can be a very solid, a solitary sort of um, endeavor. And, right. uh, and having a, a group like IDA around, um, it really helps us realize, you know, one, we're not alone, and two, that there are people and resources out, out there to help us. And and I'd love to get into a little bit more of that, Simon. Yeah, sure. um, we talked recently on on the show about, of course, the importance of a, of a fiscal sponsorship. Mm-hmm. And and I would love to ask you, because IDA is, is always, always um, often a name that comes up as, as, a, as a possible um, fiscal sponsor. And, and I would, I'd like to ask you why, why IDA would be an appropriate, uh, appropriate avenue for fiscal sponsorship. Well, thank you. There's lots of great organizations out there who provide fiscal sponsorship from women make movies and, and many others. Um, IDA has been doing, doing this work for a long time. And, and I, we have a team here led by my colleague, Amy Halpin, who really knows the ins and outs of, of how to run a fiscal sponsorship program. Mm-hmm. You know, the, um, the challenges, uh, obviously, for filmmakers are, you know, in accepting either charitable dollars or philanthropic support. Uh, it can be complicated to set up your own nonprofit organization, right. particularly doing it one film at a time. And the expense and the administration that goes into that can yeah. be overwhelming. So essentially, we take that burden away from from you and do it, do it for the filmmakers. Um, at, at the same time, you know my colleagues um, who run that program have terrific expertise. And what what does it mean to try and get an NEH grant? You know, which can be a very <laughs> complicated and and highly rewarding process, yeah. but is not easy. So there's a lot of advice and other support that come with being part of a fiscal sponsorship program that actually ties into a lot of our other work. We have um, a lot of other uh, educational and support services that we provide to the field more broadly. But I think once you're in that fiscal sponsorship family, we see people tend to access those resources at a much higher level. Well, Um, and it's, and it's, it's, it's good that you mentioned that because I think you know, obviously, the fiscal sponsorship is pretty synonymous with doc filmmakers as being a way to, you know, come under the umbrella of a, of a 5013C status, which, of course, allows for, you know, other uh, it allows for potential funders um, and, and donations uh, to be able to, you know, fall under under you use that umbrella as a way to um, have a write off in, in, in the tax uh, fiscal year. Yeah, that's the sort of the obvious benefit of a fiscal sponsorship. But what I would love to hear from you, Simon, is are there additional resources by are there additional resources being attached with IDA as a fiscal sponsorship? Are there other additional resources for the doc filmmaker that we should be aware of? So we do. Well, we did negotiate um, last year um, discounted um, insurance rates, both E and O and production insurance rates for for filmmakers. Okay, uh, and those are certainly um, available to all of our our fiscal sponsors. Um, but I think that the main thing is um, the the expertise that you're going to get in working with folks like Amy Halpin has been doing this work for gosh at least ten years, yeah. probably longer. I should look back. Yeah, right, <laughs> um, right. Who, who also under I mean, Amy and I were just going back and forth this morning uh, on email about you know what's the implications of the tax of the new tax bill yeah, for right. China, and how will that affect documentary filmmakers? Or so we're looking at how we can both educate um, our uh, documentary community about you know what you know what effect that could have on them and how they should be planning for it that remains to be seen mm. what that 
what it what it's all going to shake out to be, but certainly it's something that we're keeping a close eye on. So I think you know it's it's really the the, the expertise in in funding that our team brings to it. But there's also you know we you know we do a, a rough cut screening series both as a way of uh, called Docu Club, um, right. uh, which is mostly fiscal sponsored films that happens in New York and LA, and that's not only a way to for filmmakers to get feedback on their films but it's also a community building tool bringing people together and getting them to talk about what they're working on and we see a lot of collaborations that come out of that that type of activity and i'm and, and i'm gonna we'll uh we'll hold off on docu club for a minute because i do want i do want to talk about that but sure. i think it's worth noting um you know i had I, I was dialoguing with a a, a a listener of tdl and 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 she was she was telling me that uh, the IDA is her fiscal sponsorship, and and when she was talking about her experience, she she truly had nothing but glowing, um, glowing remarks to make about IDA. She felt like your staff was very accessible. Um, they worked with her intimately to help her shape her budgets for her grant applications. They helped her with some tips for grant writing, and 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 for me, this is this is um, this is a big deal. Um, the accessibility to resources and to help like that, because I, for one, and and they'll remain nameless at this point. But but my first the first fiscal sponsorship that I ever had, um, while they certainly functioned as a a a five hundred one c three umbrella. Um, I didn't find them particularly accessible. And so I found myself as a doc filmmaker a bit frustrated when I was hoping that there was a relationship there whereby I could be able to tap into some sort of some some resources as well. Well, I think that's yeah, I think that's I think that's exactly right. This yeah. is not um, this is not just a transactional relationship. Um, uh, this is, you know, what we hope to build as a long term partnership. And, and we see that with many people coming back to us with project after project after project. Um, yeah. So yeah. Um, that, that those relationships are very important. And you know, being accessible. And I think Amy and Tony Bell, her mm -hmm. colleague, and uh, who run that, and myself, um, you know, we try to be as accessible as possible for for any questions, even if they're not fiscal sponsorship questions. You know, we we try and help. You know, who are the distributors people should be talking to? Right. You know, let's talk about what you're doing with festivals and how we can help. And you know, um, it's 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 you know, building um, those relationships where we, you know, we want people to succeed, and um, um, we want people to get their films finished and to get them distributed and seen. Um, so if we can help to do that, then that's fantastic. You mentioned Docu Club a few moments ago, which is a work in progress screening series that offers public and members of the doc film community advanced access to new projects. And there's an opportunity there, obviously, to provide feedback, participate in behind the scenes conversations with filmmakers and creators. The Docu Club series that you run, how are you choosing the work in progress films? Is it strictly from IDA membership, or could any filmmaker apply? How, how does this work, the, the screening process? So I would say most of them are um, IDA members right. are fiscal sponsored, fiscally sponsored films, but not all of them, but most of them are. And we do them every other month, one in New York, one okay. in L.A. And, you know, we have them moderated by, you know, an editor, a producer, someone who's involved in the filmmaking process so that we are, you know, trying to provide a conversation that is constructive. Now, you know, participating in that type of activity, you know, when you have a group of filmmakers in a room or editors or professionals in this field, you know, giving feedback, you have to be in the right space. You have to be in the right frame of mind to be open hmm. uh, to feedback, uh, to be open to, you know, sometimes critical feedback. Right. Uh, um, but also to be confident enough in your own vision that you're able to select which feedback is really relevant for you and i always remind filmmakers when we do feedback conversations and this is what it's what i do them one-on-one -on -one, they're the ones who have the vision they're the ones who know the material they have so they have to then filter feedback and 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 uh, notes from people through that um uh through their own vision and knowledge of their own material right and that's that. That can be a challenge. So it's yeah. you know it, it's it's a bit of a delicate balance um, in making sure both that we find a good moderator who can guide the conversation right. in a productive way for a filmmaker, but also a filmmaker is both open enough and confident enough to 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 go through that process. 
you mentioned LA and New York City being areas where you have these this screening of work in progress films. Yeah. Something I did want I did want to um, get a little bit more clarification with uh, with IDA is do you guys I mean the name says International Documentary Association. Do yes. you consider yourself more domestic in nature working with US filmmakers or are you guys tr- truly global? So uh, that has been something that's that's been evolving since I came on board and mm-hmm. I think it's not unfair to say that for the most for most of its history IDA has been a domestic Right. organization right and and frankly a lot of its activities have happened here in LA um, it's been one of my goals to um, to really expand the work that we're doing internationally and that's taken form in a few different ways first of all we have been soliciting and working with international filmmakers as part of our fiscal sponsorship program yeah um, okay okay but, but recently actually at the um, uh, at ITFA, which is the big uh, festival in Amsterdam, the yes. biggest documentary festival in the world, we convened um, um, a meeting of organizations from all around the world that face uh, similar issues that we do when we're looking at our advocacy work. And that's another part of our work is is advocating for the field, advocating for more resources for the field, for protection of filmmakers, either uh, on a one-on-one basis Mm. where we, you know, uh, try and support filmmakers who might be facing either legal challenges or some threat to their First Amendment rights. But we recognize that, you know, these are challenges which many organizations around the world are dealing with. Mm. And we don't, you know, we're not looking to take up their work. We're looking to support their work. So we brought together this coalition of about 40 organizations from, um, you know, from South Asia, from Europe, from South and Latin America, from Turkey and the Middle East, who do similar work, uh, whose missions are aligned, whose missions are aligned with IDEA to, to really, for the first time, talk to each other about how we can be better supporting each other's work. Ah, I see. So that's, that's, um, that just happened in November. Oh, fantastic. Uh, that's a great way to get things going. Yeah, and we just published an article about it on our website at documentary.org. Okay. And that's work that we're going to be looking to continue to build this coalition of international organizations, really to see how we could be more effectively coordinating with, with each other. You know, there's threats to public media around the world, there's threats to free speech around the world. And to the extent that we can be a voice to help amplify and support others work in that space, I think that's a good thing for us to do. Excellent. I think with that, let's let's. Why don't we just get into IDA membership? Your membership includes discounts to hands-on workshops. There's networking opportunities, eligibility, obviously for fiscal sponsorship, unlimited access to Docu Online. Give us a snapshot of what Docu Online is about. So those are our. Um, so we do master classes and workshops and conversations with filmmakers and exploring their work. Um, we have a masterclass coming up um, uh, in early January with Heidi Ewing and Rachel Grady. We just did a conversation with um, with Errol Morris. We did a masterclass with Stanley Nelson. So th- those are the types of activities that we make available through Docu Online, and those are the online seminars. Um, so you can come to them, attend them in person. But of course, we know many people are either not in New York or Los Angeles or right. San Francisco. Right. So we want to make those available to our to our members, um, our members online. So that's that. that and those, uh, you know, range everything from, you know, a, a retrospective of someone's career. Um, the the conversation with Errol Morris was fascinating. Mm. To you know, a hands-on practical um, conversation with with a filmmaker like Adam Irving on interview techniques and lighting for interviews. Right. Right. Um, so it's um, everything that we think might be useful for doc makers to be learning from and to be inspired by and i don't think that the docu online should be underplayed at all it's i i I was going through it and there really is a a plethora of incredibly valuable content there whether like you said it's interviews or career retrospectives with filmmakers or sort of hands-on workshops and that benefits everyone that doesn't just benefit somebody from la or new york city um it it benefits that you know the independent filmmaker who's who's based out of helvetia west virginia or something so it's 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 important to know that and um because i was i was impressed in, in going through docu online and seeing all that you guys 
uh, had to offer there. Um, Simon, what is the cost of IDA membership? So the IDA membership is, for students, it's $55. Right. For just a regular individual membership, it's $85. Mm-hmm. And you get access to, to all of those uh, all of those benefits. Actually, students, it's $35, I should say. Okay. And it also includes a subscription to Documentary Magazine, which is both a quarterly print publication, but also publishes, um, uh, in between those issues, a lot of articles um, online to, you know, articles about the field, legal issues, the economics of the field. Um, uh, so I think um, it's, you know, 85 bucks. I, I know that's not nothing for a lot of people, but I think it's, 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 a, it's a reasonable bargain. And then I think one of the nice um, fun benefits of it is you get to vote in the IDA Awards yeah. for Best Feature and Best Short. So you get um, online links to all those films in uh, November of every year, and you get a, an opportunity to vote on the winners. And and for for my listeners, I will go ahead and, and obviously be posting a, a bunch of information about some of the topics we talk about today with IDA and, and of course, uh, links to IDA membership. And we'll post those up on, on the show notes. Uh, I think there's a great segue there towards the end of what you're saying, si- Simon, and, and that's the IDA awards. Which we, um, we had uh, the Career Achievement Award winner, Lourdes Portillo, on the show um, mm-hmm. um, two weeks ago, and mm-hmm. uh, and what a f- amazing uh, body of work um, that that woman has done, and the conversation that I had with her was was so um, it was very inspiring, and uh, a very down to earth uh, woman who just had so much to say on on the subject of documentary filmmaking, including sort of the importance of documentary from from here on out, and. Uh, Wow, what 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 a what a, what a great achievement for her and and, and great recognition from from you guys. Um, what else can you tell us about about the IDA Awards? Uh, tell us about some of the films, some of the doc films that uh, that were up for for best feature. Well, for best feature, it, um, you know, this is an interesting year on the award circuit because um, every show is coming up with a slightly different uh, list of films, which I think is exciting for the documentary community because it's not. There's not one obvious uh, runaway winner this year right. as there might have been in years past. So this year we had our five nominees were Matt Heineman, City of Ghosts, mm. uh, Faces Places by Agnes Varda and J.R., which is a delightful film, um, Strong Island by Yancey Ford, which right. you know premiered at Sundance last year. Yeah, it's made a ton of noise this year. Yeah, and it's and you know, rightly getting a lot of attention um, LA 92 by Dan Lindsay and TJ Martin. And the winner of the award was, um, with Dina, uh, by Antonio Santini and Dan Sickles. And, um, which was a little bit of a surprise. I have to say, I thought, I thought yeah. for sure it would be city of ghosts or, or strong Island. It's, that's nice I to think, see a surprise like yeah. that. It's, I, I think it's nice to see a surprise. I mean, you know, any other voting body might have picked any other one of those films. Yeah, there's right. no, they are, they are. And I, I don't mean this, um, globally. They, they are all, fantastic films but you know i think it's um i was surprised and and actually quite happy that that dina got it it's a lovely it's a beautifully crafted film it's a it's a love story Uh, it's something that maybe um gives us a a, a little bit of healing at the moment in these challenging times Mm. um uh and uh you know the film you the film did great at sundance last year it won there um has perhaps been overshadowed a little bit by a lot of other films that have come out since. Um, but I think it's a terrific film, and it's, a, it's definitely a worthy winner. What else can you tell us about the about the IDA Awards in terms of any filmmakers or films that you wanted to highlight? Well, you know, I, I was um, uh, particularly happy to see Yancey Ford um, yes. receive our Emerging Filmmaker Award. You know, Yancey's been working on this film for years and years and years and now the film is finally done and it's out in the world and actually you know changing the conversation around around race and criminal justice and racism and and i think it's a very brave film so i was very happy for yancey to get that um, i first heard of yancey's film uh earlier in the in the summer um we had on filmmaker Shalice haas um who did a film called real boy and and one of the things that I tend to do with these conversations towards the end is I'll ask for 
um, I'll ask for three or so either doc industry guests or, or filmmaker suggestions. And uh, and Yancey was was at the top of her list, and so we've been we've been trying now for a little bit to get her on the program, and um, and hopefully we will have her uh, on early in the new year because it is an exciting film. Um, her DP Alan Jacobson, I have a, a connection with um, with a, a, a fellow colleague that I, I am great friends with and do a lot of work with in Portland, Oregon. So um, there's some ties to it as well, and. Uh, yeah, it would, it would be very excited to have her on the program for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I would say the other highlight of the show for me, it was, it was a terrific show this year, but the other highlight for me was um, we give an award every year called Courage Under Fire. Yes. And that's to a filmmaker who has shown extraordinary courage in, in making a particular film. But this year we decided actually to give it to four films and the filmmakers – uh, about who are telling stories about Syria, um, but not only to the filmmakers, but the, to the people who shared their stories. Right. Uh, right. Because I think um, uh, we need to remind ourselves that the people who share their stories with us in this field often put themselves at great risk, physical risk, and, and, and particularly in this case, you know, where you have people on the ground in cities like Aleppo, Aleppo and else right. in Syria that. Um, it was important for us to recognize their contribution because if it wasn't for them sharing their stories, we wouldn't know about this. Mm. Um, so we awarded it to the filmmakers and the, the, the and, and the people who shared their stories with with um, uh, Evgeny Yefineski, who did Christ in Syria. Again, Matt Heineman, who did City of Ghosts. Faraz Farad, who did uh, Last Man in Aleppo. Mm. And Sebastian Junger. Uh, and his partner who did um, uh, Hell on Earth, uh, The Rise and Fall of Syria, and the, yes. the, the, false, the Fall of Syria and the Rise of ISIS. Um, so I think it was that was a very emotional moment in the ceremony this year because we had people from the films there um, wow. talking about how important this work is for them. Wow. I, I imagine that that award speaks a bit close to your heart as well, um, having been a recipient of, of Peabody Awards. Um, I yes. think you... You have an understanding and appreciation for that wo- that world. That's fantastic yeah. to hear. We'd love to have any one of them on the program talking about their work. As we get closer to wrapping up here, Simon, can you tell us a bit about uh, mentorship? Are there any mentorship programs that IDA currently offers? It's funny you ask about that. We just had a, a long, full-day staff and board strategic planning meeting uh, uh, this past Saturday where we're all together kind of looking at the next three to five years about where we want to focus our energy and that was one of the top areas it's an area where i think we have not done enough work in i certainly have done a lot of work in that space um with right. filmic over many years yeah. on a one basis and i remain available um uh, i i do that you know regularly and almost daily to some extent um um but I think we do need to build up a more formal um, mentorship process. I think it's happening uh, in part through our enterprise fund where we're working, particularly we're going to be working with the filmmakers who receive R&D funding through that fund. And we've just selected those films and they'll be announced um, in early January where we're going to be looking to build up a more formalized mentorship program for those filmmakers. But also we want something that goes beyond that too. So I think you can look to what we'll be doing in the next year or so and having a more robust we'll we'll uh, definitely keep an eye on that i I would say simon and and obviously you know i'm preaching to the choir here but i i I have such a high percentage of of doc filmmakers that i myself know as well as um as well as listeners who the idea of a mentorship is is something that really can elude those of us who don't perhaps live in live and work in new york city or or la and may not seem to have uh, may not have have as uh, have the access that, uh, that that other folks would, and so if you guys come up with, I, I guess I would just say that uh, I think it's a wonderful idea that you guys are are talking about uh, putting some sort of mentorship program into place that um, that that would make that a bit more accessible to to um, to those of us who may not have that kind of access to uh, yep. to that, and um, because as you know, um, it, a mentorship can be. Um, can be vital to, to the success yeah, of, a, of, a, of any sort of creative, but uh, certainly yeah. doc filmmakers. I, I think that's one of the wonderful things about the documentary community is that people are so open to actually 
sharing knowledge and sharing resources. Yes, everyone's competing for funding, but I think there's a much greater openness in this field than there are in many around um, you know, making sure that we are creating space for the next generation of voices to come through. I, I, couldn't, uh, I couldn't agree more. I think in the documentary community, Simon, there's this there's like this this understanding that that we're all you know it, I'm not trying to sound cheesy at all but that we're all in, in similar boats yep. um and I think that 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 there is a community that develops because of that certainly you see it with this program certainly you see it with what you guys are doing with with IDA and that's very much at the heart of what we try to do here on uh, uh, or foster, I should say, with the with the documentary life is this um, this networking and this support group and this sharing of in- information amongst like minded individuals who are all in this in this thing that we know and love called documentary film. I think um, I talk about this on the program. Uh, those of us who work in commercial, um, we are a much more uh, easily connected community. Um, if for no other reason then it's it's our it's really our lifeblood it's how we make our livings and so it's only natural that we're connected because we need to know who the the producers and the production managers and the coordinators are because they're the people that are helping us get the work and so we're naturally connected whereby doc filmmakers can be such a solitary group that uh, we're not connected but necessarily by necessity and yet we're the ones that are the most in need of it and the most lacking of resources well, and uh, if, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, if I can speak quickly to that, that, that question of connection, you know, and yeah. it's something which um, I want to make sure people know about. We do a biennial conference here in Los Angeles called Getting Real. Yeah. Um, and it's a three day convening. And last year, 2016 was our last one. Um, uh, so it'll be coming up September 25th and 2018. Okay. Um, uh, we brought together 700 filmmakers from around the country and actually around the world to talk about you know, issues of career sustainability, how does one really make a living in this space, to talk about the evolving art of documentary filmmaking, and the creativity behind it, to talk about diversity and barriers of access into the field and how we can overcome those. Um, so we're working on um, programming that conference right now and we're working on the themes of what the conference will look like, but it will certainly build on what we did last year. And I, I think is... Um, there's not only a great opportunity to come together as a community, mm-hmm. uh, learn from each other, but the networking opportunities. The that we had, you know, you know, a hundred mentorship meetings actually as part of that wow. conference, one-on-one meetings where we would pair experienced people in the field with people who were more emerging mm. um, to really have a conversation about their careers and how you know how they can approach them so you know that is something um, which we're very excited about um, bringing back I hope uh, people will be able to join us at that for at least part of it you know Simon where can we get more information on the getting real conference that sounds like a fantastic opportunity there on, on documentary.org there's a, a link at the top of the page uh, for getting real and you can also look back at the, the conference programs for 2016 and 2014 there. And there's a lot of articles that come out in Documentary Magazine which cover similar issues um, or are based on conversations which grew out of the, 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 the conference. Last year we had keynotes by, by Marcia Smith and Grace Lee. Uh, which we published in the magazine, and the videos of those are also available online, and they're incredibly inspiring about how they made their way in this field, and really a kind of a clarion call to action for, you know, more diversity and more open doors into the field. I think we we like to pat ourselves on the back in this field as being, you know, more open and more diverse, but we still have a long ways to go mm. to uh, live up to to I think where sometimes we think we are uh, is still yeah. challenging for a lot of communities to break into this field. We've been speaking with executive director of IDA, Simon Kilmery. Simon, are there any sort of final thoughts that you might impart to my audience about document, either about documentary filmmaking in general or about IDA, your organization, that maybe we have not covered yet? You know, I think it's a very exciting time to be entering this field. Um, I think there's a, you know, when I started working in documentary in the late 90s, uh, it was kind of on the margins. It was kind of the broccoli of entertainment. I think it's moved into a much more central space, uh, or this part of the spectrum in terms of people's entertainment choices. You know, there's forums that, that uh, it, we're no longer just talking about feature-length documentaries. Right. 
TV documentaries, but we're talking about creative work, which can take in multiple forms from shorts to series to uh, emerging um, um, emerging technologies and how that affects storytelling. So I think it's a very exciting time. At the same time, this is you know this is not a a field where people come in to get rich. So I do think people have to be clear eyed and be looking, you know, because some of these films can take years to make, as you well know, oh, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, that, um, that they have to balance their their lives and, and, and their funding opportunities. So it's, you know, it's good when you can also teach. It's good when you can also shoot or edit for someone else. Being multi-skilled uh, in this business, I think, has, has benefits for um, career longevity. Simon, what a pleasure having you on the program. I, I can't speak highly enough. I, I, I can't wait to get this uh, information out to my listenership. What IDA is doing is incredibly important work, and I've long wanted to have this conversation with you. And uh, you did not let down, good sir. You did not let down at all. <laughs> Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me on. Don't forget, we'd love to have you join us in the Documentary Academy. Come and take a look at how we can help you make your best documentary film at thedocumentarylife.com slash academy. That's thedocumentarylife.com slash academy. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you soon. Thanks again for listening to the show, and remember to like and subscribe to this channel. Also, remember for any of the URLs that may or may not be outdated, and you want to get the most up-to-date information, perhaps for the documentary filmmaking courses, for the blog, for other episodes, just go ahead and check in the show notes below on this YouTube page, and that'll give you the correct URLs to use. Thanks again. Have a great day.